Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verses 13 through 15 this morning. Now last week I shared with you that we could take this entire letter of Galatians and break it down basically into three sections, a three-point outline if you would. Uh, Chapters 1 and 2, that's where Paul talks about his history. That's where he goes back through and recounts for the Galatians his preaching. And what he wants to do there is show that not only has he been consistent in preaching that we are justified by faith, but he also wants to show that the apostles had um, acknowledged that his preaching was in line with the very things that they were saying. Now, it was important because you remember that, that Paul was confronting a group of false teachers that had come into the churches in Galatia, started saying that in addition to your faith, you must add the works of the law in order to be truly saved. In other words, you've got to put your faith in Christ, and then you've got to follow all of the Old Testament law, and that's what really makes you a follower of Christ. That's really what uh, makes you right before God. Now, uh, one of the reasons we've done this with the, uh, uh, the little preview video that we do every week is that if you took every world religion and boiled it down, basically they come down to this one word, do. Uh, you've got to do something in order to be right with God. You've got to follow the rules. You've got to follow these practices. You've got to do these things. And Paul recognizes that that is exactly what the Galatians were falling into. So in chapters 1 and 2, he shows his history. In chapters 3 and 4, he goes back and he begins to lay out what we might call the doctrine. He he wants to explain exactly what uh, his teaching is and what the doctrine of the church is. And and probably the the best summary passage in all the book of Galatians on justification by faith is found in chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, where Paul simply says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So we also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So Paul lays out the doctrine in chapters 3 and 4. Now, we started last week looking at these last two chapters. In chapters 5 and 6, he begins to take all of that he's taught so far and begins to put it into practice. This is the application section of the letter. If you think of it as a sermon, Paul had his introduction in chapter three and uh, one and two, his, his main thesis in, in chapters three and four, and now in chapters five and six, he says, this is how you put it into practice. And last week, we talked about the first of those commandments, which was to stand firm. Paul wants them to understand that they are to stand firm in their freedom, that that Christ has set us free from this, this burden of trying to live under the law. And so he tells the Galatians, stand firm, stay right with your heart, hold on to the truth, hold on to the doctrine, stand firm in it. And now he wants to begin to lay that out. When we come to verses 13 and 14, he's going to tell us a little bit more about our freedom. He's going to tell us specifically that freedom comes with responsibility. It's not that Christ has set us free just to do anything that we want, but rather it is a freedom to follow Jesus, a freedom uh, from the, the worry and the obligation of the law, the freedom from the burden of the law, freedom from the bondage of the law, and yet there is a responsibility that comes. Look at what he says in verse 13. He says, "'For you were called to freedom, brothers,' Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another." He reminds them that they have been called to freedom. This is a reassertion of what he's already said back in chapter 5, verse 1. You see in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm there for and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He wants to remind them that they have been set free from the bondage of the law. But here the emphasis is on their calling. Calling. 
This is the third time in the book that Paul has used that little word call. Back in chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. In chapter 5, verse 8, just a few verses before this, he says, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. He says to the Galatians, this persuasion to go back under the law didn't come from God. When he uses that word call, he is emphasizing the role that God plays in our salvation. And you'll notice something in, in Paul. As Paul lays out the doctrine of salvation, it is not so much about what we do to be saved it is what God has done to save us. It is, his emphasis is on the work of God. So he goes back and he says, listen, he says, um, uh, he says, you were called to freedom. God had a divine purpose and a divine plan. You go back and you think about what it means uh, that God called us. It reminds us that we are loved by God, amen? It means that we are accepted by God. It means that we are guaranteed an inheritance in his kingdom. He says, you have been called to freedom. But then he makes a caveat. And the very next phrase, <clears throat> notice what he says. He says, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Now, if you think about Galatians, there's really basically two groups of people that are causing problems in the Galatian church. One, we've labeled the Judaizers. Those are the people who say that in order to truly be saved, you must follow the law. But there is an opposite group. And this happens a lot in churches. If there's a theological debate in the life of the church, there tends to be a pendulum that kind of swings. One group will hold this a doctrine to the very extreme, and another will swing the pendulum all the way back to the other side. So on this side, there's the Judaizers saying, you've got to follow the law in order to be saved. But way off on the other side, there was a group that was saying, hey man, we are free in Christ it is now party time. <laughs> and we can just do anything we want to do. We can just throw off all the restraints. We don't have to worry about anything because we are saved by grace. Every once in a while throughout the, uh, my ministry, I have met one of those. By the way, we call those two groups Judaizers, and then the other group is what we call antinomians. That's a pretty fancy word. You ought to write that down. Auntie, no, you can impress your friends today when you go to lunch. You go to work, you go to lunch today and people will be talking about saying, oh my, what did you learn at church this morning? You said, we learned about antinomianism and they will be impressed. Can I tell you a little secret? They'll be impressed that you were at church. And I want you to, because they probably didn't have church this morning. And you can ask them, well, how'd you get to lunch if you couldn't get to church? All right, and, uh, but... <laughs> That's a preacher picking at something, all right? <laughs> all right, but anyways, uh, um, uh, th th that other side is the group that says, we can just kind of do anything we want to do now because we're saved by grace. And every once in a while, you'll run into that person. Uh, throughout my ministry, there have been times when I've run into people who, who just say, well, man, I've been saved by grace. I can just do whatever I want to. I can drink, I can cuss, I can carry on, I can go on and run around on my wife, I can do whatever I want to do. I had a guy one time tell me this, and I probably told you the story. He came to me, he said, well, I'm going to leave my wife. He had two kids. He said, I'm going to leave my wife. I said, How, why are you going to leave your wife? He said, listen, he said, I found this other lady that makes me happier than my wife. And I said, but here's the bottom line is you're married to her. You have a commitment to her. You have a covenant with her. And God says, you've got to stick it out and you've got to work it out. He says, yeah, but I think God wants me to be happy. And by the way, this is his next word. I'm saved by grace. I won't lose my salvation. I can do anything that I want to. I'm going to tell you a little secret. If that is your attitude, you better very seriously question whether or not you are genuinely saved. The truth of the matter is, is that people often take the gospel and their freedom in Christ as a license to continue in sin. The word flesh here is a reference to the impulses and desires of our sinful nature. Timothy George defines it this way. He says, flesh refers to the fallen human nature, the center of human pride and self-willing. 
We can read just sum it up, say, to live according to the flesh is to pursue life in one's own strength and by one's own moral reasoning. Without consulting the scripture, without considering what would God desire, it is that just simply desire to do what we want to do. William Barclay has given maybe one of the greatest definitions of the flesh. This is what he says. He says, the flesh is what man has made himself in contrast with man as God made him. The flesh is man as he has allowed himself to become in contrast with the man God has meant him to be. The flesh stands for the total effect upon man of his own sin and of the sin of his fathers and of the sin of all men who have gone before him. And here's what I like. He says this, the flesh is human nature as it has become through sin. The flesh stands for human nature, weakened, vitiated, tainted by sin. The flesh is man as he is apart from Jesus Christ and his spirit. As we're going to see in the coming weeks, Paul lays out a very simple thing. You are either living according to the spirit or you're living according to the flesh. Every single day, every single moment of our lives, we make a simple decision. Are we going to walk under the direction and control of the Holy Spirit, or are we going to walk under the direction and control of our old sinful desires? Paul says, listen, You've been set free from the bondage of law. You don't have to try to earn your way to God. You don't try to earn your salvation. But when you are saved, there is a responsibility that comes with that. We don't use our freedom just to do what we want. In fact, Paul's going to define himself. In fact, the, the defining way that Paul characterized himself in his epistles is that he is now a slave of Jesus Christ. He is a bond servant. The word, the word bond servant is an easier, cleaner way of saying that he's a slave. And think about what he says here. Paul says, we have been set free from the yoke of slavery to the law, trying to earn God's merit. But we exchange that slavery for something far better. We then place ourselves under the slavery of Jesus Christ. Now, see, that word comes with a, a negative connotation, but you kind of got to understand where Paul was coming from. The, you know, there about one-third of, of, I'm sorry, but, but about one-third to one-half of the Roman Empire were classified as slaves in Paul's day. And slavery could be a very bad thing. You, you, you lose your freedom and, and lose your ability to do the things that you want. But also there were times when you would have a very benevolent, very kind, very good master. And in those occasions, very often when you had served out the number of years that you were there to serve as a slave, uh, then you would say, uh, I think I want to continue. If I was a slave uh, there for Danny, and, 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 and Danny was a good and he was a kind master, and I would decide, well, you know, at the end of this, I, I really would just kind of like to stay with Danny. He, he's been good to me. He's been kind to me. He's been gracious to me. He has been a good master. Then what I could do in that day was I could give up the rest of my freedom and I could become his slave for the rest of my life. That's what Paul is defining here. He's saying, listen, you're no longer under the oppressive slavery of the law, but now you're under a good, kind, benevolent, gracious master. And so he says, don't, don't, don't live after the flesh anymore. Don't live after the dictates of your old sinful nature, but rather come and follow Jesus. Notice what he says. He says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. He says, freedom isn't there for you to indulge your sinful desires. It's not license for you to just go and follow any old whim that you have. But rather, it is now freedom to serve one another. And the word serve there, by the way, is the very same word that he uses for slavery in the rest of the book. 
It's a, it's a, it, 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 and, and here's what he goes. He says, freedom must be focused then on serving one another. For through Christ, we have been set free from the slavery of the law and the futile attempt to earn God's favor. But this freedom is not intended to be abused or used for one's own selfish purposes. Rather, we exercise our liberty in Christ by becoming servants of others. What I do is now give my life to service for Jesus and serving his people and his mission. And so that's why Paul says over in Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 11, he says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves. Paul says, listen, in Philippians, he says, this is the mindset that you ought to have. It should be the very mindset that Jesus had. And listen to what he says. He says, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped. He said, look, have this mind. Jesus, even though he was equal with God, even though he shared all of the same attributes and all of the same nature as God himself, he says he didn't count that as something to be held or to be grasped or to be uh, uh, held on to, but rather, verse 7, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here's what Paul literally says. He says, Jesus did not account equality with God be something to grasp, but rather he emptied himself. And you hear what he said? He said he took on the form of a servant. That's the same word Paul has used over in Galatians. He has become our servant servant. How did he serve us? By going to the cross and dying for our sins. Was that God, was that Jesus putting his needs or his desires ahead of us? No. Or, or ahead of himself? No. He put our needs and our desires. He became our servant. He became a, 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 a sin for us. He gave himself as a sacrifice for us. And what Paul says is, that's the way then you should live out your freedom in Christ. Not using it to indulge any whim or fancy or, or whatever sinful desire you have, but rather to follow and serve Jesus. Jesus kind of goes along that same line. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus lays out, the, he summarizes all of the commands of the Old Testament into two simple commands. Isn't that awesome? He takes 10 commandments. He says, if you boil it all down, it comes down to two things. The first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Amen? That's the very, very first command. Love God with everything you are. That's the first four commandments. He summarizes them in one thing. He says, all that's about is loving God. And so that's the first. The second commandment, he says, is to love your neighbor as yourself. That summarizes the next six. You'll notice that Paul grabs onto that second commandment. He says in verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says, listen, if you want to see how you live out your freedom in Christ. It is by loving the people of God, loving your neighbors, loving them enough to share the gospel with them, loving them enough to live out the gospel in front of them, loving them enough to serve them and minister to them and care for them. But can, I, can I say something very honestly to you? I'm afraid that sometimes in the modern church, We've messed this up a little bit. And I'm afraid we, we get it wrong here a lot. We're a very loving church. We do a very good job of serving and ministering to our community. Remember a few years ago when the flood came? <laughs> Man, we loaded and carried sandbags. And we, I'd see senior adults out there loading and carrying sandbags. Not only did we put them down, we helped pick them back up, which was a far worse task than putting them down, by the way. When there's a disaster or there's a problem, 
Our church is extremely good at loving our community and going out there to serve them. Amen? We're good at that. But can I tell you one of the things I'm concerned about sometimes? Is that in all of the serving and good that we do, we forget that in the midst of that, we must also share the gospel. See, what I think has happened is in our, the church in the modern day is what we've done is say, well, as long as I'm serving people, as long as I'm feeding the hungry and clothing those that need clothes, picking up and putting down sandbags and doing ministry kinds of things, they'll figure that out that I'm doing that in the name of Jesus. I, I'm going to tell you I don't think that's true. I think we must also tell them the gospel, Amen. Amen? If you love somebody, you'll tell them when something's out of line in their life. If I'm not over there in my office right before services, and um, my hair is messed up, or I've got something on my face, or I've got something that's undone about my outfit, Cliff or John will say to me, hey, brother, you need to buckle that up. Hey, brother, you need to fix that hair. Hey, brother, you need to take care of that before you get up there. Why? Because they love me. They don't want me to look like... Well, they don't want me to look like an idiot any more than I already just naturally am going to look like an idiot, all right? And, uh, but, but, but you get what I'm saying? They want, to, they want to take care of that. They love me, and they're going to tell me that. That's a wonderful thing. But here's the point. If we love people, we've got to tell them the most important. Now, I don't want to hear, when Cliff comes up and he says, man, you look terrible today, you need to do something. I don't like to hear that news, but I appreciate that he cares enough for it to tell me that. Amen? We need to tell people the news that they don't always want to hear. That as a result of their sin, they're lost and on the way to hell. But God has made a provision and God has a plan. And he sent his son to die for them so that they can have life so that they can be forgiven and reconciled to God, and that in order to receive that gift, they need to turn from their sin and they need to trust Jesus. If we don't tell them the most important message, Cliff and I were talking here a while back, we know a, a missionary family who's a wonderful missionary family in many ways. They're, they're very dedicated folks. They're very lovely folks. They're, 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 they're folks that, 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 that I have no doubt have an extreme commitment, probably more committed to what they do than, than, than a lot of folks that I know. But in the midst of their missionary work, they go out and they, they do all kinds of wonderful things. But the point they never get to is they never tell anybody about Jesus. And I want to submit to you, we do not love our neighbors if we'll not tell them the most important message that they'll ever hear. And so when he says here that we need to serve other people, that's partly in preaching the gospel to them. But he also is talking to the church. In fact, he's specifically talking about inside the church here. Notice what he says. He says, but if you bite and devour one another. You know what he's using there? He's using a picture of wild dogs. In the ancient world, they were scared of wild dogs. It was a frightening thing. See, dogs weren't cute, cuddly little pets. My little dog, Koi, is a cute, cuddly little dog. He hurt his tail the other day. Did I tell you about that? Doggone dog hurt his tail. I don't know how you can hurt your tail. I don't have a tail. Maybe I'd understand it if I had one. All right. But he hurt. We think he broke his tail. Brothers and sisters, I might have to pay to have a tail fixed on a dog. That's crazy. All right, anyways, he's a cute cuddly, lovable little dog. They didn't have cute, cuddly little dogs in Paul's day. When he talks about here about devour, biting and devouring, he's talking about a pack of wild animals that seize upon someone who's weak or hurt or lame. 
and they jump on top of them and they bite them and they pull them apart and they tear them apart. And all I can think sometimes is he must have been in a Baptist business meeting at some point in his ministry. He must have been a part of a church that he saw that. Have you ever seen Christians? It's bad when you turn on the animal planet and you turn your TV on and there's a picture there and an image of of animals tearing themselves apart. It's so sad though. Brothers and sisters, I've seen it in church and so have you. Someone's hurting, someone's lame, someone's broken in the church and what they desperately need is someone to come alongside them in the name of Jesus to serve them and minister them and love them and care for them and build them back up. And really sometimes what happens is the church acts like a pack of wild animals and jumps on top of them, pulls them apart and rips them to shreds. And apparently that was going on in Galatia. And Paul is saying, you can't do that. You can't say you love Jesus and not love his people. You got to love one another. You got to serve one another. Amen? You got to build it up, not tear it down. The greatest tragedy in the American church, we sit there and we lament. We look every year and we say, my goodness, we're, we're, we're not... We're not winning many, as many people to Christ as we used to. We're not, we're not seeing the number of baptisms. We're not seeing the church increasing. In fact, uh, evangelical churches across America are declining it right now, not expanding. And we sit there and we look and we go, why is that? What, what, what happened? And, I, you know, and, and there's a thousand theories for it. There's a thousand theories. I was, you know, you go to a conference and this guy will say, well, it's because, you know, we're doing this method or we're not doing that method. Or, you know, every, every product I get in the, in, in the, in the uh, mail anymore tells me how we can, you know, triple our attendance in church if we would just adopt this program or that program. Every year I go to Jacksonville and, uh, for a pastor's conference. And there's this guy that runs this ministry down there. He stops me every year. Every single year I'm down there, he stopped. Hey, man, you'll sign up with this, and you'll do this, and you'll do that. Can I, can I tell you a little secret? I think what hurt the church in America is, is that sometimes we have fought for the right things in the wrong way. Y- y'all get the point? You can fight for the right thing, and you can do it in the wrong way, and you can lose your testimony. I heard W.A. Criswell say this one time. He was talking about the conservative resurgence among the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, he said, you know, he said, here's our problem with our conservative theologians. And, and I, I'm in that camp. He said, here's our problem. He said, we have the best theology and the worst dispositions. Because sometimes in our standing for the truth, and we should stand for the truth. Did you ever notice what Paul says? Speak the truth, but he he gave a caveat there. Do you remember what the caveat is? Speak the truth with as much anger and passion as you can develop. Was that it? Speak the truth with as much abrasiveness so that they'll know you really mean what you say. Speak the truth in a way that they'll know they're being tough loved. Does it say that? No, it says speak the truth in love. If we don't love the people we're serving, (laughs) then I'm afraid our service is in vain. But if we will stop and just simply think through the lens of the gospel, it'll change all that. We are loving people who may on the surface be very unlovable, amen? They may be very unlovable, and yet Jesus loves them. We serve them because that is a person for whom Jesus Christ died. And therefore, they have value. Therefore, they have purpose. Therefore, their life has meaning. And therefore, if I love Jesus and he loves them, amen, then I can love that person even though they may be rather ornery or difficult. 
I'm so glad I'm here because an old preacher one time looked past the, uh, the hard, difficult to like or res- difficult to understand exterior of my dad and loved him enough anyways to tell him about the gospel and he got saved and as a result of that I grew up in church and I got saved, amen? What would have happened if that old preacher would have showed up one day? And if you don't know the story, I'm just going to summarize. My, my dad threatened to kill the preacher who had come. He threatened to hit him with his wooden leg. And uh, not my dad's wooden leg. He didn't have one. Uh, but the preacher's wooden leg. And uh, threatened uh, to beat him up. And yet the preacher kept coming back and telling him about the gospel. And my dad got saved. Amen? I, there wasn't a lot of redeeming qualities to my dad at that point. He cussed worse than anybody I've ever heard. He was a mean old steel worker. All right? He, he was a tough man. Yet someone looked past all of that and loved him the way Jesus loved him. And guess what happened? I'm here today. Amen? Amen? You know, you got somebody. There's some folks out there in our neighborhood. You know who I pray for in our community? I pray that the dirtiest, rotten scoundrels in our community get saved. And then I hope they join First Baptist Church. Amen? Well, you say, oh, wait a minute, preacher. We don't want those. We took you. Amen? We took you. And I'll be honest with you. You read the New Testament, see the guys Jesus hung out with. They weren't always the cleanest, most noblest people. We got to love them. Don't bite each other. Don't devour one another. Here's the deal. If we can't love one another, we can't love the world. Amen? So we start here and we go there. Amen? We got to understand our freedom is not to indulge our sinful flesh, but rather to serve one another. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for the message today. Lord, I pray that you take this message, you burn it on the hearts of the people. It speak to my heart, that you speak to the heart of everyone in this room. Lord, that we would see the truth of what you're trying to tell us here, Father. Lord, that we would present ourselves as servants to you. Servants to your church. Servants to the mission of taking the gospel around the world. Father, I pray that you guide us and direct us. Father, if there's one here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray today that this might be the day of their salvation. Father, I pray that you would point them towards the cross of Jesus Christ where you paid for all of their sin. Lord, I pray that you grant them faith today, grant them repentance today. And Father, that they would come and give their hearts and lives to you. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that is involved in some area of sin, some area or they just need to come to the altar and pray. Maybe, maybe, Lord, it's not some area of sin, but maybe, Lord, just they need to love their neighbor. Or, or, or maybe there's someone in the church that, that they feel compelled to minister to, Father. I pray today that they just come to the altar. Lord, pray about that situation. Ask for your guidance and your leadership. Father, help us to use our freedom in Christ to minister go on mission with you. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.